Okay, let's start. Hello, welcome to the audience. Welcome to our two speakers. I will introduce them in a minute. My name is Martin Schulte-Wissermann, and we're talking today about urbanism in times of digital revolution. Digital revolution comes along with having uh, cellular phones. So please uh, shut out the cellular phones, or at least make them silent. Okay, I see some people are now working on this. Big challenge. Okay, what is, um, what is digital revolution, digitalization in uh, cities? This is, of course, what's going on. We're seeing it uh, everywhere, and this will be the topic of uh, tonight's uh, discussion. I introduce on my left side uh, Stenek Rip, is this pronounced correct? Yes, hello, nice to meet you. And uh, he studied medicine. He's a manager in, or he was a manager in healthcare industry with a focus on uh, digitalization. He was the lead pirate for the, uh, can, uh, for the elections in 2018. He then formed a coalition and is now the mayor of Prague. And with this, he is the first mayor in a European capital. So please welcome Stanek Rup. <laughs> On my right side, it's uh, Patrick Breyer. He's a lawyer and uh, he's a long-term civil rights uh, liber liberties activist. I noted. Uh, he, is, he was the former chair of the Schleswig-Holstein Pirate Party faction in uh, the Landtag, the state uh, parliament. And now you probably know he is the lead candidate for the Pirates in Germany for the Euro 2019 uh, elections. So please a warm welcome also to Patrick Breyer. So, as an icebreaker, let's start. How does it feel to be the mayor of such a big city as Prague is? And how did you do it? Uh, how, uh, how is this? Well, uh, it's fast. It's very fast and uh, very busy. And uh, that is something that uh, probably should people know before they go into the politics. It takes a lot of time, a lot of time that you can also spend with your family, your children, wives. Uh, so that is something, and I'm very, very, uh, I think that the people who will really spend their time this way uh, deserve the respect in all the countries and all the cities. So uh, thank you that you're also doing the politics in your free time. Spend the evenings uh, in discussions and campaigns. Okay, and now Patrick, the same question to you. How did you get the lead candidate? How did you do it? And uh, how does that feel? It does feel like a huge responsibility. If you consider um, European politics at the moment, you can see that um, our deputy, Julia Reda, is playing a very important role because she is uh, defending the freedom of the internet, really, and just by herself. And that, that is just huge um, footsteps that she's leaving that will definitely be difficult um, to fill and um, work as effectively, efficiently um, as she does. But um, I'm anxious to try and, um, yes, well, you know, defend uh, human rights in a digital age. So I'll do my best and I'm looking forward to uh, cooperating closely with the uh, Czech Pirates. Thank you. That was a nice introduction. And now let's get started. Let's right, jump into the swimming pool with uh, a kind of nasty first question. It's difficult to answer because it's also a brief introduction, a brief definition 
of digital revolution. So in general, what is digital revolution? And does it lead to the land of milk and honey? Or does it lead, or is it the starting point for dystopian horror? Okay, that's a hard question. Um, well, it is quite inevitable, the rise of the modern technologies, and we have to be prepared for the things that was not uh, expected just a few years ago. So uh, we cannot ban the technologies, obviously, because uh, it's not a way how this could be done and uh, because the bans would be circumvented in one way or another. So the only possible way is to adapt to the new situation and uh, uh, using the legislation and other measures that will uh, allow us to uh, deal with these uh, issues. Uh, I was just... Uh, Two months ago, or three months ago, I was in Barcelona at the Smart City World uh, Expo Congress, or not sure how is it called exactly, but uh, there were exhibitions of uh, various vendors and various cities, because it's a Smart City Conference, so various cities have their stands on the conference, and uh, they were showing their attitude to the smart cities and so we had our virtual or extended reality project there and you could have a virtual tour in the Prague tram for example on our stand and these things and simulation of uh, uh, possible um, disasters in the city on, uh, on the virtual map and so on. And uh, I also went through the halls and looked how other cities deal with the issue and yes some of the cities a little bit scared me in fact for example i went uh, around the uh, russian stand and uh, the stand was uh, in black and red colors and look a little bit like hell literally <laughs> And there were a big screen and cameras, and uh, the system was used. Uh, uh, that there was a system installed as an exhibition, who did some scoring of the behavior of uh, people coming around, going around, and scoring them uh, how risky their behavior is. So I was looking at the camera, and there was this big screen, and there was this big uh, big uh, sign pointing at me and the score of my risk behavior and it was really really scary and uh, this is something that we have to have in mind that the, the digital technologies are a good servant maybe but definitely a bad master the same question to you i fully agree with uh, what stanek said um, the digital revolution really creates an information society where we can uh, quickly um, retrieve information and communicate at all times. It also networks um, things and uh, means that, you know, uh, if there is a security issue, it doesn't just mean that a computer won't work, but um, that lives can be at risk and a danger. And I don't think we've fully grasped um, the power of that um, technology. And also, I think people need to understand that this knowledge and this information is power. Uh, it means that, um, you know, um, power can be shifted. Power that used to rest with us citizens can be um, shifted to the government if they know very much about us and about our lives. Uh, at the other t on the other hand, we can control the government better if um, information is being provided to us. Um, the um, economy and um, global internet corporations can have lots of power about us if they uh, know our weaknesses and exploit that commercially, uh, if they discriminate us, for example. And so it really is what, what Stenek said. We need to make sure that this digital revolution um, is about people and about our rights. 
you know, the, the right to know, to access, to, to self-determination, and also to participate. And that is not about uh, new ways to make money or new ways to control people. That is the danger of it. If I can add just one thing, maybe that uh, just uh, uh, we in, are right now in Prague uh, and generally in Czech Republic dealing with uh, sort of affair uh, related to a company called Huawei. I maybe maybe you have heard uh, uh, that some other countries have uh, some problems also with this company and. Uh, in the media, it was quite. Uh, it took the media space um, quite recently, and uh, for example, it appeared that uh, this company actually some so a sort of sponsored uh, our presidential office uh, by giving him a free mobile phones. And uh, at the same time, the mm, National Bureau for Cybernetic and Informational Security issued a warning that they actually uh, there is a problem with the, this vendor and that uh, you should be aware of using their products in the critical infrastructure of the state or local government. So, uh, this is something that is an important aspect of, uh, for example, also a foreign politics that didn't occur in the previous times. And right now we're spending our time uh, checking whether the, or not the city or the transport company, Metro, for example, is or not is using the Huawei or ZTE products uh, in their critical infrastructure. So it is something that actually this way we are sort of interfering actually into a foreign politics from the municipal level, which is quite strange, uh, which is quite strange. Okay. <clears throat> So now that we have uh, this starting point, uh, let's go to some more specific uh, um, things that are related with uh, cities, with big cities, with urbanism. And let's start with maybe one of the main things in a city that's traffic. I mean, we have uh, large possibilities, opportunities now in electronics age, but uh, of course uh, also side effects can arise and sometimes these side effects are even worse than the point you started from. So what about Prague, what about uh, traffic in times of digital uh, revolution? Well, um The concept of smart cities evolving through the time. It's quite a recent topic, so it's still uh, going up and still people are actually trying to find a way how the technology should be used in a proper way to make people's lives more comfortable in the big cities. Uh, of course, the one of the big area uh, that uh, a lot of uh, companies focus on is uh, mobility, public mobility, but also uh, sort of um, shared cars or elec uh, electric uh, shared cars and so on. So uh, it is definitely an important area for each city. The problem is that in the previous time, Maybe the focus was on uh, different things in the smart city area, like uh, smart uh, benches or smart uh, lights on the streets, which generally uh, turn it out to be quite expensive experiments. Uh, that was very good to if a politician wanted to make a selfie close to this, but it had not a real positive impact on a substantial amount of the citizens. So what should be explained right now to everyone who wants to talk about the smart city 
is the fact that the smart city is about data, it's about open data that is uh, able to provide you either a better management of the city or more comfort of the life of the citizens. The problem is that, uh, for example, the city of Prague has a lot of uh, contracts with uh, companies that uh, allows a sort of vendor lock and uh, the companies own the data that are created during the um, operations of the city and the city doesn't has an access to them. So a typical example is that the, the each of the bus in the city has got its GPS module. The transport company uh, knows where the bus is. They can use it for their purposes, but they cannot share the data f for both technological and uh, mm, contract uh, reasons. Uh, it's simply not possible. It's the black box. And this is a complication because if we would know if there would be an open data set for with the positions of the buses or trams, it could be shared and uh, could be, for example, the people can... Uh, it would be possible to look on the mobile phone and uh, tell if the bus has got a delay right now, which is not possible right now. And uh, this is the real smart city. The how to make the life of the people more comfortable and to allow a better management of the city. Maybe the same question about traffic to you, Patrick, but uh, um, maybe we touch here also the European level, because when one thinks of uh, autonomous driving, for example, I think this will at one time need European uh, ruling. <clears throat> On the one hand, autonomous driving, for example, is uh, a very nice thing. Um, very convenient, but on the other hand, if all cars have 20 cameras and the data is uh, shared in real time to somebody, of course, this is the total and mass surveillance of all public streets. Uh, so how can we dissolve this uh, contradicting two uh, aspects of uh, the digital revolution? What matters is that when you develop this um, smart city or digital revolution, you need always need to keep um, privacy in mind. You need to keep um, security, um, IT security in mind. Um, so, you know, often the mistake is made that either um, they don't do enough, they don't use technologies, they don't use opportunities that there are, or they do too much. Um, just you know, without thinking, without thinking critically about it, um, they use these technologies. Also, there may be some sectors that are so important to security that you don't want some systems to be connected to the internet, for example, when it comes to to power um, services, or even um, I wouldn't want my uh, my car to be connected because you know it has been shown that. Um, car systems have been hacked and you could um, control them um, even from another car depending on how the technology is made and yes in, in the case of a driving car it's really your life that depends uh, on of it and so um, I wouldn't want a system that could be possibly controlled for, from the outside or another example of EU legislation is um, this um, Emergency module, e-call, you may have heard of it. So all new cars need to have technology built into them that automatically alerts the police when you have an accident. Um, and I consider that as um, an interference in my privacy because, you know, in, in my own um, home, uh, if I collide with the garage wall, why would the police have to know about it? Maybe they'd find out that I'm not entirely sober or something. I mean, you can discuss um, in what cases you might have a legitimate interest for the police not to be alerted. And um, so I think 
this needs to be kept in mind when designing those policies, but I don't think it prevents you from using the technologies. It just needs to be uh, used um, uh, intelligently uh, with people who are competent, who know the limits of the technology, where, where it shouldn't be used, and um, who have an, an ethical um, background uh, to it when, when thinking about them. And uh, I like the example that uh, Stenick gave about the um, sharing the real-time traffic information. In Germany, it's even worse because someone tried to share the, the time schedule of uh, trains in, in Germany. So when, when does uh, the train, uh, uh, the time, time schedules of uh, trains running throughout the country? And that was prohibited or banned because um, the uh, nobody actually has the right, even uh, the Deutsche Bahn doesn't have the right to share the information of the timetables of um, public transport. And I mean, this is crazy. That you could do uh, so much, uh, create apps and um, you know, improve on the um, systems that Deutsche Bahn provides if you could use this data. And um, the same applies for a lot of traffic management, uh, like um, parking space, uh, um, traffic congestion. So it could be used a lot better, but you need to make sure that um, you can't um, uh, use it to monitor, to surveil specific people. So it needs to be anonymous aggregated data rather than um, personal data. Okay, so uh, let me ask you a, qu a question in the same direction. Could one uh, uh, summarize uh, this uh, contradiction between privacy and surveillance, uh, that public data should be private and, no, private data should be private and public data should be public. Yes, people keep thinking that there is a contradiction uh, between uh, privacy and transparency, but it's really just a matter of where does it apply. Transparency applies to government because um, politicians are acting in the name of the people, so they should be accountable to the people. You know, the European Parliament decided this week that uh, meetings with lobbyists will have to be disclosed, which is something that they don't have to do in Germany, for example. So the European Parliament is progressive in that way. But at the same time, uh, private data, which applies to myself, not in the capacity acting for others, but just for myself, uh, for my family, etc., that just um, needs to remain private. So it's no contradiction at all. Okay. Well, yeah, you will eventually uh, come to the point that where those two areas uh, are in touch, where the public means means private space meets private space, and this will be, for example, when uh, you ask for the salaries of some. Uh, uh, some public servants or something like that. So, uh, for example, in Czech Republic, the common consensus is that the top executive salaries should be public, but uh, some other uh, lower executives, it's uh, it's um, the the privacy exceeds the the public uh, public interest. Yeah, and. Uh, Basically, the problem is with uh, the fact that, that there are that there is uh, this is a result of the High Court uh, of uh, of uh, many proceedings at the court. But the problem is that some of the offices in Czech Republic still do not respect this result, and they simply do not want to give. The information out. So uh, in Prague, for example, we uh, we are creating a position of uh, the um, open data officer to facilitate the transparency on the level of the city. But of course, uh, this is because we have a pirate mayor. But uh, it will take some time till all the cities will have their pirate uh, mayors, of course, the on it. possibility to uh, support it from the top 
would be uh, would be easier. So, for example, our uh, members of the parliaments now proposed uh, a law that uh, the the office for uh, private information uh, defense uh, protection, yes, yeah, so the, the office for private information protection. Uh, will have the role of a sort of arbiter in case that there is this uh, ping-pong situation when the citizen wants some information and uh, the, some office doesn't want to give the information out and once again they uh, do this ping-pong. So in that case the citizen could ask the uh, data, um, the, the private data office to just uh, give him the, the information uh, from the office. And uh, this is a much debated right now topic because the lower part of the parliament uh, said yes, but the upper part of the parliament said no. So it's going back again, the law, and our members of the parliament will try to push it through once again. So we will see how successful we will be. Unfortunate, but I believe this is not the case of uh, Germany, but for example, we had uh, big problems with the uh, transparency even on the level of the presidential office. So this is something that uh, uh, probably you do not have here in Germany. Maybe I can add a case um, concerning the transparency of salaries, because there was a case in the city of Lübeck, which is close to where I live, and um, a subordinate employee actually um, earned lots more than other colleagues who had the same functions. And the reason was that he was not only a, a trade union representative, but also um, the head of the Workers' Council. Uh, the Workers' Council um, in Germany has uh, certain powers to, um, you know, agree or disagree with certain policies. And so that was a public, publicly owned company. And what they did was um, possibly to corrupt him by, um, you know, bribing him with a very high salary. And uh, so I agree with the principle that um, the salaries of, of subordinate um, employees should be um, should be private. Uh, but I think there can be specific cases where you have reason to. Uh, look very closely and find out, uh, you know, what is the reason for this. Actually, he was uh, laid off in the end when they found out and when it became public. Sure. Uh, it's about balance between the private and public. And for example, you can still make uh, public the information that person A has got a salary off and person B has a salary off. Uh, you just do not uh, give out the names, for example. That is also possible, or should be possible in Czech Republic, but as I said, not all the offices respect this uh, this way. Let's move to uh, an aspect uh, where you're uh, specialized in, health. At least I uh, know that uh, you were in the health uh, industry, and uh, um, I'm not an expert. Could you please explain what uh, the di digital revolution will do in, uh, with health and our treatment and the way we live in cities? Yes, well, the, the electronic health or e-health or um, the digital revolution in health is basically uh, a really, really complicated thing, at least in Czech Republic. Uh, I've seen a lot of ELS projects that just didn't went well because uh, the the issues with privacy is extreme in this area, and uh, of course there is a big concern about uh, what will be done with the data if there should be uh, big uh, data silos concentrating a lot of uh, privacy informations. 
So I'm sort of uh, keen to the way of more decentralized models of uh, electronic records and so on. So uh, when you keep just a minor part of the data on a central level, basically just to know where to ask for more data, this should be maybe kept central, but uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise this should be decentralized to minimize the risks of uh, the privacy problems. And uh, of course, the, it is very, very uh, tempting to use the digital technologies in health for a variety of things. But this is one of the big areas that you should always have in mind that the, you could also create problems. And it's maybe not even problems, uh, not just problems with the privacy. You can also create problems regarding the patient safety also, because uh, the technology is not uh, safe by itself. It just creates another other points of uh, possible failure and you have to be always aware of that when you design the digital systems in healthcare. Okay, talking about health, uh, what can be done on or what should or must be done on the European level from the European Parliament in order to manage the developments that are going on now? Well, I don't think that the EU needs to meddle in all um, working policies at a local level. So I think that um, they should keep out of it if um, it can be uh, dealt with um, at a local level. For example, what works quite well in many cases is um, monitoring of the health status if the person consents, of course. Um, they don't need to come in to the doctor all the time, but they can just, um, you know, uh, deliver um, data and... Um, you know, um, the um, clinic can look at them and see if there are any anomalies. So that, that can work well um, with certain patients. And, and what the EU should do is really provide a framework uh, to make sure that, um, that the, the um, safety is provided for of, of the components and of the networks. Um, to make sure that the privacy is um, guaranteed and um, that not too many authorities have access to the data because basically in health as in other areas it is about trust so it won't work if people will uh, refuse to, to um, use the technology so you need to earn and deserve their trust and that means um, firstly um, thinking about does it make sense to use this certain e-health aspect or system? Sometimes they don't work or they aren't effective. They don't really, uh, aren't really used to the people. So you need to decide on, on this is issue in a transparent and democratic way to get people involved in asking them what kind of services do you actually need? Wh which ones would you accept? Which ones uh, wouldn't you accept? Um, have an open process. You need to make sure that it's voluntary. Uh, actually, the the um, German e-health infrastructure is all the opposite to what Stenek rightly described. You know, having a decentralized um, uh, system. Uh, the the German infrastructure is to be centralized uh, with this huge project that um, uh, took billions um, that they spent billions on. Uh, it took ages to set up and um, still it is a centralized system where um, if you lose your key, uh, your PIN, uh, you know, other people can access it. There is a backdoor key with the operators, so um, it's not actually private between you and your, um, your doctor, your health data. So that's actually the wrong way um, completely that, that um, they are, they've designed the uh, system. And um, so I think that um, the EU can contribute, for example, with research projects into um, investing in research to set up uh, decentral and safe uh, systems. I think that will make sense. 
Okay, hop on to the next topic, uh, and we can now look at it from a, a city level, or then also from the uh, high European level. What is with the big issue of lobbying, corruption, political influence? Um, we can't all can't hear uh, the word Robert Mueller anymore. Um, um, so. How do we deal with it and with this problem, or um, what are we facing in the next years in digital revolution? Well, regarding the transparency and uh, anti-corruption uh, um, area, well, uh, the city of Prague uh, has uh, certainly uh, uh, some way uh, uh, <laughs> in front of it in this area, so uh, we have a lot of plans, uh, definitely. But first of all, we have to uh, use the open data and um, to allow the public uh, check or public control of these things, because the, this public, uh, the, this public, not surveillance, it's a public uh, control of the things the public view inside yeah, of these things is uh, definitely a system uh, system uh, system measure how to control the corruption because if these things are public then there is always uh, it's always better because the people do not do some things if they know the data are public, Let's put it in simple words. So, uh, for example, we want to make public a list of the, um, of the properties of the city, so it will be clearly visible if it is landed, to whom, how much does it cost, uh, when it will expire, and so on. Because, uh, for example, Landing of the city property is one of the big areas uh, where the corruption risks are very high, because you can always uh, you can always have a reason why you do not use a commercial rent, uh, why you subsidize some some activities. In uh, by using uh, a lowered rent, for example. So this is a big area with corruption risks, and therefore this area should be made as transparent as possible by using the open data. So this is uh, things that we will focus on in the few ne next few months. Prague. Do you want to add something? Well, you know, lobbying um, is really a key risk of corruption uh, because um, the influence of money on politics means that it is not the citizens who have a say. It's not uh, in the best interest of citizens that policies are designed, but in the interest of uh, profit and uh, big money often. And that is a huge problem at EU level because uh, there are nowhere as many lobbyists in Europe as in Brussels. Um, they, they find open doors to influence uh, policies, um, often because of the way the EU is designed. For example, the uh, European Commission appoints um, special advisors. They are supposed to be specialists, but often they're actually lobbyists. And also there is the revolving door phenomenon. You know, um, people who uh, pursue industry-friendly positions in an office will find it easy to um, get a good job afterwards. So they are bored by the industry. And, and the other way around, the industry keeps managing to simply send lobbyists um, to parliament or to public service. Um, some people uh, work for corporations at the same time as being uh, members um, of the European Parliament. Uh, so um, there's so much that needs to, to be done. And um, among those things are um, 
disclosing the influence, um, what do people earn besides their official um, salary? Um, making, uh, you know, making sure that it is transparent. This influence, um, whom did office holders meet? Um, what documents did uh, lobbyists? Um, give to policymakers and um, politicians uh, need to disclose um, this influence. But also at the same time we need to give um, people more of a say. And that is um, an opportunity that uh, the digital revolution provides that you can use e-participation to engage your uh, community, to, you know, to ask them questions, to present construction projects. You know, we're thinking about um, building a road or some other major project. What do you think of it? Um, what options are there? Should we be doing it at all? Um, or we would like to present you with this bill. We are thinking about passing a bill. Um, provide us with your comments. Um, electronic tools are great for that, but you can also have um, offline meetings with, um, with citizens to engage them. And I think that is greatly supported by um, digital tools and needs to be used much more at EU level because the EU is so is huge and um, digital tools could be very effective in helping people to have a say and not just lobbyists. Okay, coming to the end of this second section, let's now touch another important uh, thing which will change dramatically, um, education. So what impact uh, does digitalization have in Prague and how are you dealing with it and which way are we heading? Well, education, uh, education is uh, something that is very interested in particular for a pirate party in Czech Republic and uh, on generally on all the levels. Because uh, first of all, uh, we think that only through uh, reform of the educational system we could reform the, the industry. That's the first thing. And then we could possibly uh, stand against the global uh, competition as one thing. And the second thing that actually I believe that uh, of course we need a sort of national reform of the educational system. But I believe that on the municipal level we could do a sort of pilots of the reform because there are some rules that needs to be fulfilled but uh, you still have some freedom in this sandbox which is not used very often um, most of the time is just uh, mainstream comfort classic educational system that is there from the time of Maria Theresia uh, from the 18th century or something. But uh, you can still fit in the rules with some alternatives. And that is something that I would like to do in the education in, uh, in Prague. Of course, this involves also using a digital technologies in a modern way. Uh, and uh, this should start from the very beginning or at least uh, as soon as possible. And we should also focus on uh, specific groups in the education uh, and uh, working with the technology. So, for example, I was in Pilsen just yesterday and they had uh, they had a class of programming for girls specifically to motivate the girls into the technology area for example so yes it is a little bit discriminating because it's not a course for for boys and uh, i believe uh, for example, some members of our party would definitely would have the problem with this. But I think that this is still on the on the white side or on the bright side of the force. And you, education, is this uh, relevant, relevant for European politics? I mean, one could think of uh, a class not, 
necessarily has to sit in one room, but uh, you could have children from all over Europe, for example, once a week having class together, or what else could be done on a European level uh, that uh, is affected um, by a digital revolution? One challenge of the digital revolution is the digital divide between those who are, uh, you know, uh, digital natives and maybe financially privileged um, and those who are um, maybe too old or maybe too poor to be able to afford technologies and to know how to use them. So that means that um, firstly there should always be alternatives for people who can't or don't want to use the digital media, especially with um, e-government services, which are very important, but they shouldn't be forced on people. And so in Schleswig-Holstein, for example, the state um, where I was a member of parliament, we wrote in our constitution that um, people shouldn't be discriminated because they don't use online services. So that's important because um, often it is cheaper to provide services online, and so cities could have the idea well, you can come and see us personally, but then you need to pay for it. And so we, we didn't want that. We wanted it to be um, voluntary and not discriminating. And so education is one way of um, getting people better involved because you, you've got all students um, in the institutions, um, even those from underprivileged families or from um, socially um, poor families. And so... If the, if the educational institutions provide um, technology even to those who can't afford it at home, um, the schools and universities can be a place where you can try to narrow or bridge this um, digital divide. That's what makes it so important. And I agree with Stenek that um, in the age of the digital revolution, um, you need much more education to be able to to deal with um, technology but also to be able to appreciate information you know everybody's discussing about uh, fake news and um, how do you quickly remove it from the net but I think what's much more important is um, to be able to know that it is fake news or maybe the source of this piece of news is not trustworthy, so I don't believe it. You can never remove um, fake news or um, you know um, unwanted content. You'll never never manage to remove it all. So you need to qualify people to, uh, especially young people, to qualify them to know how to deal with it, and that is a very important um, aim that um, the education um, needs to take care of better. Okay, thank you. Now let's come to our last section uh, of this discussion. We all three here on the stage are pirates and we're all Europeans and uh, we're all people or humans. Uh, so the natural question now is what and, <laughs> and, and we have uh, elections, European elections <laughs> coming uh, um, this year. So, what should, could, or must, or can the pirates in Europe, and specifically the pirates in Germany and Czech Republic, do to have a better future, to have a brighter future, and to manage uh, the digital revolution? Be happy. <laughs> uh, well, uh what should we do? Well, um, first of all, we have to have enough people that will be interested in the topic. I would say um, enough people that would be able and willing to involve uh, in the politics or the public, uh, the, in the public things, because of course it's uh, much comfortable to just keep it to others because some other people could definitely solve that in their time but uh, I had come in my personal life to the conclusion that probably 
if I want to do it, probably no one else <laughs> will do it in the way I would like it. Because, yeah, a lot of people would do it in a lot of different ways, but not just the way I like it. And this also is related that they would choose a different way, maybe in the terms of privacy protection and the, um, they will uh, hold the security issues in a very different way that uh, you may see these days maybe in China with their social score or uh, f f other specific technologies that uh, really could scare uh, could scare a lot of people. So uh, what should be done? First we need enough people who will be willing to do something with it and then of course we have to exactly as, as Patrick said uh, we have to um, give them the education in a way that they will be able to recognize what is um, what's behind the scenes basically so this is maybe two most important topics but it has a lot of uh, consequences regarding that for example if you have to focus on your uh, on your uh, social being uh, that uh, you have a lot of um, problems with your life with your common operation basically that you do not have so much time checking for checking the informational sources of the fake news and so on so this has got a lot of consequences and uh, we should also keep an eye on those social uh, issues that are necessary to be solved. Okay, what do you think that uh, are we as pirates and we as a, um, as a planet uh, have to do to have a brighter future? Well, I think the digital revolution will fundamentally change our lives. We've heard some areas today where um, we will be affected and um, I think we've heard that um, we need a compass when we deal uh, with, when we manage that digital revolution, um, because you need to know which direction um, things should, should go. And um, I think for us, for, for pirates, um, what is at the core of values is uh, human rights and um, democracy, um, transparency, participation, that is really um, the, the compass that we follow with these um, technologies and that we have in mind. So you need people who are ready to think critically before taking policy decisions, to be open-minded, but um, you know, think things through. And people who are competent, who know the opportunities, but who also know the risks of those technologies. You know, people like Zenek or uh, Julia at uh, the EU Parliament. So we need um, competent people, and I think that um, the pirate movement can contribute people who are valuable in the democratic process from that point of view, because they contribute a perspective that um, others either don't have at all or that is not the focus of other parties. And that's why I think um, the pirate movement is extremely uh, valuable for our future. Okay, so keep on pushing. Uh, the time is up now for this discussion, but don't leave. Now, of course, is time for questions and answers. Uh, if the audience has some questions, it's now your time. Just shout them in here and I will repeat it for the microphone so that uh, we know what uh, was asked. Yes, you. Yes, I've got I repeat the question. Uh, will money, cash, survive? And 
will, or will we pay in electronic payment systems in the future? Well, I, need, we need, I think we need to fight to make sure that money <laughs> survives uh, because uh, money um, is anonymous and therefore it is about privacy. And you can have legitimate reasons to, to keep your payments private. For example, when you support certain causes, um, like political causes, uh, religious institutions, when you donate um, to um, NGOs that have activities re related to um, sexual identity, etc. So there are many um, reasons that you can think where you don't want to be associated with something that you may want to support. You don't want to be held accountable to it. So I think that there are legitimate reasons in principle to be able to pay and do transactions um, anonymously. And uh, despite all dangers of money laundering, I think that um, they should investigate them in a targeted way rather than putting everybody and all money financial transactions under a general um, suspicion. Also, there are more risks of um, digital um, financial transactions. There is security risks. Um, there is a risk that, uh, you know, uh, negative interest rates may be imposed, so suddenly they keep deducing money when you can't take it off the bank any longer. Um, so um, I think digital payment is a good thing if it's voluntary <laughs> and um, if it can be used anonymously. You may be aware that there are um, payment cards that you can buy anonymously in some shops, but already they have been limited to a maximum amount of 50 or 100 euros, so you can't uh, digitally pay um, larger sums of money, which um, only goes to show to me that if they did away with cash, then the entire system of um, privacy, of financial privacy, would be uh, done away with. And so I think we need to, um, to resist um, the beginnings of it and also ideas to limit the value of bills or to, to limit the maximum value of um, transactions. All those ideas are, are beginning um, to spread in politics. Obviously, some countries are much uh, further uh, than Germany um, in the use of um, digital money, uh, where people don't usually pay in cash anymore, in Scandinavia, for example, in some places. Um, I think it should remain, you should have a choice. And um, maybe it can also discriminate against poor people in the streets if you can't just um, give them a euro any longer. I also hope that we are not the last generation enjoying the anonymous cash, really. Further questions? I repeat the question. The question is, uh, why should one want that the salary of people in parliament is public and not the, also the salary of every person? Well, well uh, generally, <clears throat> we as a pirate, uh, we as a pirate party have a specific, specific, me specific uh, attitude to this. So we make our sell or all our salaries public. So uh, not just uh, our members of the parliament have their salaries but also some people who are, for example, if some executive boards of some companies owned by the state and uh, basically if they are nominated by any other parties, no one knows their salaries. But for our members, we, are, we have a web page and the salaries are public of our people. But uh, I believe that in those cases, in case of uh, that is, uh, mm, for example, function where you are nominated by the parliament, it should be public. But it's a uh, it's a matter of balance between um, of the public interest in this area. So you should be able to prove that there is a public interest of 
uh, that you would want to know and make this information public. For example, if is it uh, some assistant of an assistant that has not the decision rights on the public budget in any way, it is quite hard to explain why this particular piece of information should be really made public in an opposition of the manager of a public uh, office who has decision rights and his salary definitely should be public. So it's a sort of a balance and there is definitely a very hard to uh, tell a rule how to uh, really look at this. It's case by case mostly. Do you want to add? Again, in Europe, um, the perceptions are very different. So you've got the Scandinavian model, for example, where you can look up your neighbor's income because all tax, tax records are being published. So maybe that is uh, what the model that you would like, where all uh, income is transparent. But um, I prefer the model where, um, in principle, your salaries are uh, private unless um, where there is an overriding interest and in somebody um, to know. And uh, one reason why that may be good is um, tax honesty. So people might be more willing to uh, report truthfully on their salaries if um, they uh, can trust in their information being kept private by the tax office rather than it being distributed and disclosed. So that may be one reason uh, why um, a privacy of, of income may be favorable. But of course, um, members of parliaments and high office holders um, should be obliged to um, disclose their earnings and also including private earnings in the case of members of parliaments because in that case there is an overriding public interest in knowing um, is there a conflict of interest, um, who's paying them. For example, there was a German uh, member of the European Parliament who was working for Bertelsmann at the same time as serving in Parliament and of course that sheds a very specific light on his doings and dealings knowing that. And so I think the public have a right to know about that and therefore in the case of um, members of parliaments they don't have a right to um, privacy of their um, income. Uh, I repeat also this question <laughs> and I phrase it like this. Currently, the situation is that the Czech pirates are very, very, very successful and the results of the German pirates are not quite as good. <laughs> that wasn't the question. <laughs> so, well, I believe the, the difference is that we had uh, much more time to uh, evolve, to to organically grow, basically, because we didn't have the big success at the beginning. And that is something what allowed us to make uh, internal, uh, clear the internal problems before we went, uh, we, we, before we went out, basically, out of the garage, I would say almost. So uh, this was maybe our both problem and both uh, reason of the success. Because at the time of the race of, uh, for example, German pirates, we uh, in Czech Republic had a race of another alternative, uh, which was the Andrei Babiš uh, party called Anno, and uh, which turned out to be a sort of oligarchical company uh, division of his uh, <laughs> of his uh, holding, a political division of his of his company holding. So um, that gave us four more years to. Uh, be sure in our internal 
things, basically. And the second point of our success, I would say, is of course the inability of uh, the old parties, but uh, also a very good job that had been done by our uh, members uh, in Prague City Assembly. Uh, who had uh, a lot of success in, for example, dealing with uh, corruption affairs and uh, opening the office and so on. And we always uh, went uh, making our uh, work an example of how we would like to make it in a public function. So we have our register of the contracts for our internal party uh, things. So all our uh, campaign contracts are public. And we are the only party in Czech Republic who does this, for example. So uh, these, I believe, are the key factors of our success. Also, because in the elections in 2014, we had, uh, um, or 2013, we had a limited uh, in the national parliament, the elections for the national parliament. We had a sort of limited success because we crossed the line to get funding from the state some some we get some money for the further campaigns but we didn't cross the line to have our people in the parliament so this allowed us to make the next campaign in a professional way without any sponsors basically or with a sort of crowdfunding but not with a big sponsors and uh, that is probably also uh, a factor in our success because we could afford a professional marketing s political strategist uh, that we could rent and uh, although his job was not the only element it was also based on a lot of work of our volunteers and our members and uh, also registered supporters and so on but uh, this was also uh, this also played a role and also maybe one last factor we didn't uh, uh, we do not argue uh, we do argue in internally of course but our voting our election internal election system of the because we've got a two round election system into our internal functions and into the candidate lists and so on and the uh, two round uh, election system works in a way that in the first round you have to get uh, at least half of the votes uh, it's about uh, that you're acceptable for the uh, for the voting members and therefore if there is someone who has uh, for example uh, strong groups of supporters but representing a man minority uh, minority opinion in the party he would not make it into the uh, more visible positions because he is not acceptable by at least half of the members and in the second round, you tell the the positions the uh, who is the most uh, acceptable and so on. But in there are these two rounds, and this has a significant impact that the party speaks in a single voice, basically to the public, and that was one of the key factors at the time the people did not know us they didn't understand what what the name means and so on what to expect from us there were some other parties who already sort of failed or um, 
yeah, they sort of failed in the in the previous time. So they didn't know if they should expect another disaster or if we mean it uh, for real and so on. So these were probably the key factors on our way. But uh, not sure if this is generally transferable. Okay, time is almost up. I would say Stenek and Patrick, you all have one sentence left to say, to greet to the audience. And uh, after this, there will be a warm applause. And uh, I thank you too already now for being here, for being the guest in Dresden, in Neustadt. And uh, I'm very glad that this event uh, was possible. Thank you. And now your closing uh, statements. One sentence. Keep on fighting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, politics is what you make of it. And so um, be, be engaged and stay engaged.